Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to those of you that just arrived for the second roundtable discussion for our discussions today. Um, we're thrilled to be celebrating the Witness Art and Civil Rights in the 60s exhibition and thrilled to be sharing the stage with such accomplished and well-established artists, uh, both that are represented in the exhibition and also that aren't, but are contemporaries that are very, very, very amazing artists. Um, so I'm just going to pass over the, the mic to Ms. Kelly Jones, who's uh, coming to us from the Department of History and Archaeology from Columbia University and also is a co-curator for the exhibition Witness. And also she's joined with artists from the exhibition Adamola Olubafola, I hope that I did that well, <laughs> and Jay Gerald that are both represented in the exhibition, as well as Leslie Hewitt, Adam Pendleton, Stephanie Jamison, and Kimbui Olojimi. So, without further ado, thank you. Uh, I don't know if this one, up oh, now it is. I didn't want to have to new, use my New York voice on y'all. Um, thank you all for coming out, and thanks to all these wonderful artists for gracing us with their presence and uh, taking time out of their busy lives where they make beautiful things, uh, important things, and sharing a little bit of time with us. Um, we're gonna have a little bit of a, well, basically the same kind of format, um, except I'm asking the question, uh, different questions to the contemporary artists and the witness artists, and it's basically one simple question to each of them. Um, their work will also be on the screen, and uh, so they'll be able to include that. Um, and I just want to say thanks to all of you for coming out. Thanks to the Brooklyn Museum, uh, Radia Harper, and her whole uh, staff here at the museum for doing some fantastic education programs uh, with Witness. So thank you so much. And of course, as always, to my co-curator, uh, Terry Carbo. <laughs> well, now we're going to change because this is not the this is the different PowerPoint. So, Adam, you're going to go first. <laughs> I have a whole other uh, uh, different order that I changed it to, but let you can switch. Or I can do it the way I was thinking. I am going to do the, the way I was thinking, which is to start with Stephanie. Thank you for that, Adam. Um, so the question is. Um, for the contemporary artist, do you feel your work is activist? So, Stephanie. Thank you, Kelly. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me to join this panel in response to really amazing exhibitions, really incredibly powerful work. My name is Stephanie Jennison. I'm an interdisciplinary artist. Um, my work is deeply connected to photography's core concerns. Uh, which include reproduction, repetition, documentation, and narration. I make photographs, videos, and mixed media works that evolve in the studio and develop archival and social projects that contextualize my practice and engage with other artists and with the public. Instead of um, simply trying to describe sort of my work and what it, the way that I think about activism with relation to specific projects, since we don't have uh, a lot of time, I thought I would uh, riff just a little bit about, um, des describe a little bit the general conditions, I guess, that I feel that I face, some of the challenges as a contemporary artist that I feel that I face with, with regards to the concept of activism uh, in, in, in contemporary art. Um, as, uh, as I think many of my uh, peers might also understand, I think the concept of activism uh, carries really sort of paradoxical and conflicted connotations uh, in our contemporary context. On the one hand, the, we've seen that the contemporary world really worships is, and is fascinated by politics um, as, as picture in particular, um, and as story, pictures and stories that are best observed and told from a distance, I think, um, especially the safety and comfort of historical distance. And artists who can demonstrate a fashionably working class commitment to social issues are often rewarded. Um, these artists, the art world, these are artists that our world can believe in. Their fervent belief serves as a kind of excuse or sometimes as a kind of proxy for the uh, disengaged politics of the art appreciating uh, uh, 
community, including dealers and collectors. Uh, on the other hand, work that's too strident um, or specific or indict specific people or specific communities uh, is, sometimes, uh, is sometimes seen as distasteful. It's supported at the margins, um, murals or community art that can be excluded from the center. And to make matters even more difficult, black artists uh, are, actually, are often sort of expected to make work from a political position. Uh, even the most formal, personal, gesturally expressive, the most medium-specific work is inevitably viewed as a vessel for sublimated political content. So work that is not explicitly or implicitly about, about sort of racial politics can feel illegible to critics uh, who are looking for black artists to bring them into a kind of voyeuristic proximity to cultures and lives that are otherwise uh, inaccessible uh, or unavailable. Uh, so uh, I find that activism sometimes ends up serving as a kind of muse, uh, kind of passive uh, visual muse uh, in, the, in, the, in the context of uh, some contemporary art practices. In my own work, I've been less interested in um, the glamour of politics as a, as a kind of visual subject, uh, but instead I think a lot uh, and this, um, I think what, what uh, Jack Whitten uh, said earlier really resonated regarding the importance of action uh, and process uh, with relation to, um, with relation to um, thinking about the kind of politics of an art practice. So thinking more about form, uh, not, not sort of solely about image, and thinking about form as, as always ideological. Um, I prepared so many notes, which I'm not going to be able to share. Um, but I'll just I'll just state that um, what, for me, one of the one of the most important questions is what is the mode of thought in which art is at stake. Uh, this is the question that I understand to be kind of the implicit subject of all art practice, and it's an inherently political question. Uh, what is the mode of thought in which art is at stake? Uh, and regarding the question of activism, I'm not sure that I would regard my work um, or the work of a lot of artists as activists per se, um, but, but as it's sort of inherently ideological, um, uh, it specifies and deconstructs the codes and strategies of um, our socio-political system, to speak really really broadly. Um, the image on screen is a detail of a work that was produced as part of my exhibition Same Time, and it includes language derived from a speech that was delivered by Huey P. Newton at Boston College in 1970. Uh, Newton wrote really beautifully about the revolutionary as a great despiser and a great adorer who longs for another shore. He wrote that the revolutionary is a fool and that foolishness is our great leap and our commitment to the dead and unborn. Uh, I really, um, I really sort of connect with that the concepts of despiser, adorer, and fool. <laughs> I think that these describe me pretty well, um, and, and maybe that's a good place to pause. Yeah, thank you. Can't wait on the gym. How are you guys doing? Uh, good, good, good. Um, my name is Kambuyo Um I'm from Bedside, Brooklyn. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the piece that's um, behind me, and um, before I respond to um, the question, today's question. Um, also, thank you, Brooklyn Museum. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, the whole machine. <laughs> um, this is a this is a piece called uh, Life in Pictures, and essentially, I was thinking about how there's a generation of uh, images constantly, constantly that sort of die in devices, um, whether it's computers or phones or, and I was interested in what happens when we bring those into a, a physical space and um, so I made an archive essentially. Um, this is the last time that piece was shown. It was over 2,000 photos from having a digital camera for over 10 years. And that archive is then traded in. So you bring a photo from your life and you trade it with a photo from this archive. It starts off being a kind of, uh, a description of a life. And something that Stephanie brought up is uh, how often 
or how narrow the expectation of an artist of color, particularly a black artist, what that life looks like, what that position is, and what are the expectations of that piece. Um, so when you know when you have two thousand photos from my life, it looks a little different than maybe it should. And then um, as people trade in, they're constantly confronted with the fact that how different their life intersects with mine and how seamlessly it does as well. Um, the, the piece uh, is essentially a prompt, it's a space for people to spend time and also spend, spend time with those expectations, their past photographs. Um, if you don't have a photograph that you brought with you, there's uh, facilities that print out an image on site. And so there's a whole process of looking through your thousands of photographs to figure out which one are you gonna bring into this physical space um, and then trade. Um, and in that process, inevitably, there's conversation with strangers. And, and so I think of the work more as a kind of a prompt for a myriad of different um, re reinterpretations and inspections of, of position. Um, one of the one of the things that I, I find uh, most exciting about the piece uh, is that is that you um, you constantly you constantly meet uh, in this space. I, I show up in this space and uh, spend time. I'm constantly meeting people um, from different neighborhoods, very much like my neighborhood in Bed Stuy, and I find that there's a, a kind of surprise. And I think of um, coming up through um, parents who were very politically active. I think that the, one of the greatest assaults of oppression is an assault on imagination. And I find that there's a, a surprise. And in, when you see the bounds of your own imaginations, and I really hope that in the work. So I don't think that the work actually is activist because I think that requires an action and I'll never know. It's always beyond me. I think that my work looks to plant seeds for action, for, um, for the borders of imagination to be constantly pushed or cracked or repositioned. Um, and I think that that's my hope for the work, that, um, that it can do that. And it's a faith-based process, essentially, because there's no way to quantify the impact. Like, you know, a bus driver takes you from point A to point B. If you get to point B, you know they did their job. What I do, and what I do as an artist is completely faith-based. I don't know if anyone, if it matters, if what that matter, what matter means until after action. And I may be present for that or not. And so, it's kind of the way I see it. Not bad person. It worked. Thank you. Okay. I would also like to thank Dr. Jones for the invitation as well, and um, to be on this panel. Um, it is a great honor, and I can only uh, probably surmise that the, um, uh, that there's a position that's being established here, just hearing Kimberly and hearing Stephanie so far, and I'm sure Adam, you may hear certain echoes. But I prepared something to, to speak um, to the question, so please bear with me as I'm reading. Um, and I chose two images instead of one, similarly to Kimberly. Uh, one image that is a in source of inspiration and one image that is of a uh, recent installation. Okay, um, somewhere lost in a sea of images amongst millions, there is always one that stops you, that haunts you, an image that arrests your attention and actually slows down your perception. Your view is simultaneously obstructed by and yet distilled in the act of looking. This obstruction or distillation has a form. This form falls in the space between the object of one's gaze and the viewer. This liminal space between looking and thinking 
about what one is looking at is of utmost importance. The feeling of or the attempt to try and focus your eyes on this echoing image, but the image remains in a kind of status. Do you try to imagine clarity, to fantasize in order to fill in the gaps, the spaces where the information is lacking? Or do you pragmatically admit that somewhere lost in the original moment is something that falls beyond representation in the present moment, and that the data just isn't there? Or perhaps it is protected in its own time, not meant to resurface or to be relived or retrieved in expected ways. Much of my practice points to not simply my personal, but a collective personal as a site of political agency, as the space where self-actualization occurs and is developed and perhaps sustained. This space is what liter literary theorist Jayatri Spivak would refer to as the location where the subaltern or the post-colonial subject speaks. This is an image of my, this meaning to the left, <laughs> to your right, excuse me, um, is an image of my paternal grandmother and great aunt as they move through photographic space, reflecting agency not only for themselves, but for me as a viewer, not in the early 40s, but now in 2014. Their movement and trajectory push, push back abjection. I'm haunted by such images and many more because they confuse me. How could certain bodies express such self-actualization and beauty in the face of a world and society that projected the exact opposite onto them? Wasn't life too hard and horrible, so full of disgust and injustice? I'm interested in the interiority that many of these images and my practice as an artist and not as a historiographer um, attempt to push, to push the affect of this kind of personal and such often overlooked and undervalued political and radical sensations into the public sphere for contemplation and confrontation equally. This is often a battle for me as it is a battle to find a form of address that reflects the multitude of such concerns. That it isn't locked into the complacency of nostalgic sentiment or corrective tropes or radical chic gestures, but to refer to the past of political histories in order to reveal and uncover hidden pathologies in our current state of affairs. So to the right is a project called Untitled Structures. Um, and this is a collaboration with cinematographer Bradford Young. It is a series of short, silent, nonlinear film vignettes that explores, exposes mid-century civil rights era photographic language, typographical and psychological landscapes through a contemporary lens. Exposing this tension formally through still photography and the cinematic experience of moving images. This collaboration, film installation, was formed by the invitation to view the Adelaide de Manil Carpenter and Edmund Carpenter Photography Archive at the Manil Collection in Houston, Texas. This archive consists of works by Bob Edelman, Dan Budnick, Bruce Davidson, Elliot Irwin, Leonard Freed, and Danny Lyon, and is fittingly titled The Civil Rights Era of Photography Collection. The time frame of the archive begins in the late 40s and ends in the mid 80s. It includes images from various US cities, both urban and rural. There are also several images of Americans of African descent in Europe during World War I and World War II. In response to having the opportunity to view this archive, I was interested in what it meant to have a collection of images that represents the civil rights movement and to consider if this, this is even possible. Working sculpturally through the impulse to appropriate, to collage, to cut, and to pace, I was interested in the viewer's body in relation to shifting images. And in this process, um, perhaps their perception is altered in relation to the surface of projection. And also in this highly condensed, perceivably shallow depth of field is where we, myself and my collaborator, had found space that was active. So I, I 
want to look at the, the question, is your work activist? In relationship to a question, it could easily be coupled with, which is quite simply, are you an activist? The simple answer, is your work activist? The simple answer would be yes, but it is not agitprop. It is really an answer that plays itself out in the space of the work. And I think it's important to look at the idea of artists, of being an artist, making art in relationship to being a citizen and citizenship. And too often we think that these things are easily observed, easily um, put into relationship with each other, uh, but in many ways they're explicitly different. So the work, while it is activist, while it is political, while it functions uh, in a political space, in a social space, it does not make direct or blunt statements, rather it moves in many directions at once. It is work that locates itself in language and image, image that is both moving and that is still image and language that is concerned with performance, thinking about originally people like Audre Lorde or Jim Jordan, um, moving forward towards the language poets, say, of the 70s. Um, it locates a network of ideas, um, and in that it tries to speak to a kind of simplicity to create a kind of site of engagement, a place where perhaps a protest could be staged, language could be heard, and really dwell on that word of hearing, actually hearing something, I heard you, you heard me. Um, so artists, activists, activism, protest, prayer, protest, peace, wind, wall, sound. So I'll leave it there. switch over to our wonderful witness artists who um, were here and also agreed to be in the exhibition, so we thank them for that. And we're going to switch over to a special question just for them. Um, what do you think your work offers to audiences today? Firstly, I want to know that I'm extremely happy that the next generation, maybe even two generations from me, uh, intelligent, committed, and engaged. That is very reassuring. Uh, I want to also say at this point, it's very important, I see Jack Whitman's now from, that while we are speaking of a particular period in American history, and perhaps most turbulent and revealing decade in uh, contemporary American history, we are still alive and well and contributing. So I don't want you to stick us or put us out of the past. Very important. Very important. You get to Jacqueline's work, which is exciting and revealing and innovative as anything that's going on today, and I can say that for Jay and myself. With that said, what you're looking at is a 1967 woodcut we're now in 2014. So you're looking, you're going, we're going back four decades plus. But the importance of me being able to uh, have some relevance today to the very fact that I'm alive, the fact that I have children, my son is in the audience, Alejandro, and that we've been able to impart with our, to our children the sense of urgency, the sense of commitment, the sense of engagement. So that is what part of my work is. I don't separate my visual science work from life itself. 
my life and my art has been one and the same. So what you see here is from a particular period in American history when we had to, we had a task, and that task was to begin to unravel, demystify, and destroy some of what we had to deal with. This is a, a fan, by the way, and it's commonly used in churches and so on. And it's a, it's a, a piece of memorabilia from the uh, Schomburg Center, which is one of the, the lenders to the exhibition. And as a matter of fact, they loaned this particular piece from the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. For those of you who don't know, that's part of the New York Public Library uh, system. But it's a re one of the research libraries. This particular piece says stereotypes versus human types. In the 60s, we had to deal with a population, for the most part, it was steep in this turbulent period of civil rights, uh, riots, uh, uh, upheavals in education, African nations throwing off the yokes of colonialism and becoming independent, and the fact that for several hundred years the visual culture of the United States, much of it, uh, uh, should, let me back, back up. Some of it was designed to make sure that people of color thought very little of themselves. So you have, we had the task, or we felt we had the task, when we began to realize who we were as artists, to begin to destroy these negative images and create images that were uplifting and reflective of really who we are. That was our task. So. My relevance today is the fact that this marvelous museum and this marvelous exhibition has given me an opportunity to speak to you. And it is only because of my work as an artist that I'm able to sit on the stage and impart my experience to you today. I am currently working on a series called New American Landscape. And it's more abstract than anything you can imagine. But here we're talking about the uh, images of African mass that I kind of merged into what uh, Professor <coughs> Jones has called a uh, sovereign image of African sculpture, an African art presence. And that was part of what our mission was at that point. Uh, African art was at that point relegated to antiquity. Uh, one of our mission was to take this, these forms, these cosmic forms, which influenced the entire modern art movement, and bring them up to relevance so that the large audiences can see them. One of the things when you talk about activism, we were in the streets. At the point that I was coming into my own as an artist, our people, our particular community, were not going to museums. We're not really going to galleries. That was just not part of our culture. We were into music and dance and those other forms. So one of the things, what, what, what our task was to take the work to the streets. So we actually got into the streets. And these works were hanging on the fence of a housing development on 127th Street. And, and what was formerly known as 7th Avenue is now called Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard. So the art had to be taken to the streets, and that was that's what we had to do. So that puts a different, whole different kind of tone on what we're talking about today. I'll leave it at that. What do you feel, Jay, that your work has to offer to audiences today? looking at something that was a mission of mine um, to bolster, to strengthen, to give body to, and to reinvest in, and that was the black family. It was very important to me that an awareness of the conditions of our culture experiencing 
a splitting of the family, a, de, uh, a decreasing of the value of the American black male. Um, it was important that we restructure um, that image, allow that to be a goal, and that became my flag. And if, what it is is pushing back at the experiences that we may uh, have known. And a strong black family is the arm that I feel you need to take to the revolution. So that's my beginning of activist art to an extent because I was a, one of the founding members of Africobra, um, a group that pledged itself to positive experiences for our people through our art. And Africobra stands for African Commune of Bad Relevant Artists. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing that alone, um, it's something that you relate to today as well as um, in that time. Our people are, are known to be catchy in phrases and it becomes a comfort zone to uh, those who have an experience with us, they remember they met us, they remember what we talked about, you leave an impression. <coughs> edge is a very important thing to me as an artist. I like edge. Edge leaves a cut. Um, it's like a paper cut. You know you got it. And it's very important to leave a footprint. <coughs> and particularly if you're walking in mud. So you need to make your mark and leave that impression. And this was a good jump off point for our Africobra community. Um, my background in art training started so far as um, my fashion design. Uh, in a couple of years with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. That was a good place to be. I never trained previous, you know, previous to that entrance um, in art. I was a musician, I, not in fine art, so I was a musician. So uh, it was interesting to go into that field, uh, starting off with uh, uh, an entry program that introduced me to painting and sculpting and um, just the beginnings of, of, of those eras. And it meant that when you chose a field, and I chose fashion design in my second year, the first assignment was to, um, to if you could bring the other piece up, to bring up um, a piece that was inspired by uh, an object less related to fashion at all. Go out on a building, go out on Michigan Avenue, choose a building you like, and, and be inspired. Do the design. And I found that very challenging, fresh, and I wasn't dealing in the Institute with any of the ramifications of my, my uh, the social injustice that we'd experienced. Um, frankly, I was rather naive when I, and I rambled, but I should tell you this, I was rather naive when my beginning experiences in Cleveland, Ohio, 
I, I didn't know about um, segregation, and I didn't know about prejudice. It was all sort of painted over. I went to a high school that had one third Jewish, one third Italian, one third black Americans. Um, we had so many Jewish kids and faculty members that we had the holiday off. Okay, so we didn't, you know, we we were not, in, and I had no, I had one black teacher in the whole experience, um, and she was in social studies. But Cleveland had a way of sort of brush painting things, you know, it's a very artsy community, good museums, good uh, galleries, good um, com uh, concert halls, and you went to these places as a part of your education. Uh, and I don't remember, but yeah, and, and we, did, we did go on public school tours of the, the concerts, the concert, uh, the concert leader would come to the school and bring the string quartet and introduce us to the instruments and they would play and we'd recognize what they sounded like and you could hear them in other, um, you know, in, in other beautiful pieces and say, oh, that's an oboe, you know, that's a French horn, whatever, um, and visualize it. Jane, can we, you know what, we're gonna hold that thought for now. Sure. And wonder if you have any questions or Adamola has any questions for these other people here who are not in the witness show that way. <laughs> And if you have any questions for these uh, next generations of artists as a way to uh, get into our conversation. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. uh, if I may, two things that I'd like to know. <clears throat> we had the trauma, but the distinct advantage when it comes to inspiration of being in the midst of the civil rights movement. Uh, <coughs> the civil rights movement, and I do see some of peers in the audience, so they knew, they know what that meant in terms of actual action. And as Terry writes so poignantly in her essay about evidence, um, you don't have that same kind of impetus and energy where you have, you know, on television you see in dogs you know, leaping at people and people being beaten with clubs. You don't have that today, but is, is it a different uh, situation, you still have your challenges. I also had the pleasure, and my colleague MLJ Johnson is in the audience, and was my other one of two of my other brothers from the Waves Yardists. We had, because there was, um, when I read your resume, I see the old, these wonderful uh, exhibitions you've had in museums all over the world, and, you know, Europe, Asia, here in the United States. Uh, we people like. Faith Ringo, Benny Andrews, Jack Whitten, kicking, we had to kick down doors, and I, literally, in these museums to get them to even recognize that there was a cadre, or there was a population of artists of color who were working in many of the same genres they were, uh, had something to say. So with that in mind, Right now, you, many of the things that we had to kind of go through in order to make it possible for some of you to have these entrees, uh, what is your challenges today in respect to coming together as organizations? Are there organizations like the Way You See Artists, the Way You See Artists Co Cooperative, Africobra? Uh, and what are your civil rights challenges now when it comes to these issues? Who's first? Uh, <laughs> well, I'll speak to the image that you painted or that you put forth because as soon as you describe that image and you, and you, in a way, positioned it in terms of, um, you know, we didn't see this, these images on television, like it wasn't in this um, kind of direct moment. 
But now, in a way, that same image can easily be appropriated and kind of usurped for American Express or Burger King or what have you. And I think that's what also happened in, in the 80s, which is also the time that I grew up, my formation, my relationship to certain images of protests were, were already co-opted and utilized to serve a different purpose and to produce a different kind of consumer. So I think, um, for me, part of my, um, I guess, self-actualization as an artist is also kind of reclaiming those images for, for another um, generation, including my own, being able to parse out the distinction between when something is being used for advertising, when something is being used to kind of lull you to sleep, or if something is actually connected to something that is um, towards your agency. Um, so I just wanted to maybe just add another nuance sure. to the way in which images that um, reflected the time that you were referring to um, or the time that we're all black and non-black uh, are beneficiaries of the, the, the paradigm shift of the mid 20th century. Um, now how that relates to our institutions, I think they still are in formation. You know, so there are still challenges, and there's challenges also around language. Um, the assumptions of, I think, um, Stephanie may want to jump in here, but I think uh, even Stephanie's response kind of started to, to point to um, the, the way that um, hegemony or power just reasserts itself. It keeps reasserting itself. You have to, con it's a constant battle. You know, it's never, it, it, looked, it may look different, but um, it's a constant. And fortunately, we're strong. <laughs> we collectively, people, human beings. <laughs> uh, how many people have seen the exhibition? Has everybody seen the exhibition in the audience? Okay. Just kind of bouncing off what to see what it said. Uh, there's a particular piece of it that kind of addresses what you're talking about. Add your mama. Okay. Uh, again, some of my peers know they saw Aunt your mom on the pancake box. In other words, it, we're talking about these these images. Now, Joe Overstreet took Aunt your mama and he put an MK-15 or whatever those guns are in my hand. This was his way of taking what I think you're, you're alluding to here and revolutionizing it and making it relevant. One of the things that is important in my view is it's fine to create these wonderful works of art and come into these magnificent institutions like the Brooklyn Museum. Brooklyn Museum happens to be uh, unique in the sense that it has a real commitment to the community. So it's, a, it's not, it's in my view, again, it doesn't have that elitist uh, aura that a lot of these other museums have because, you know, the, the, the uh, Bruce the Lehman has, has made it his charge to make sure that this museum engages the immediate community. But it's a part of our, our driving force, and I think it should be all of you too. You have to get the work out for people to experience it. And if you just wait for a museum to show in the museum, you're not going to really be reading maximum audience. Now, of course, you have today the advantage of social media. And that's something that we did not have in our day. So in many ways, you have a, a step up on us in terms of being able to reach out to people. You don't necessarily have to be in a museum. You can put it out on um, Facebook, or YouTube, and reach millions of people where we will confine to whatever we can do in the streets and basically in the museums and galleries, churches, community centers. So, oh, I was. Something that is, is sort of uh, rippling through um, made me think of something Leslie said earlier, where she, uh, hopefully I get it right, the collective personal. Um, uh, it, this idea that we, I think of it with, with uh, a life in pictures, the, the notion of biography is not a singularity. We are described by consensus. Um, there was a period where I was outside of New York for a long time, and one of the things that was most taxing was that I had to reassert who I was every couple months because I was a stranger. Nobody knew me, nobody, there was nothing. Like I, there was no history. 
and the understanding of myself, I realized, was not only based on what was in my mind, my memories and such, but like the next door neighbor being like, hey, you broke my, my window when you were six years old. The person being like, oh, I remember all of these different things. I remember when you helped me with the bag. So this idea that there's a collective personal also leads me to there's a collective responsibility. And I think when you talked about the active, the sort of charter of today's artist, it's to really, I, I find that it's to remind um, sort of art market, the art world, that we are not our experts on ourselves. And nor should we be that the parameters of how we are described, how we are understood, how we um, exist both in policy, in the mythic space, um, and in understanding of history is something that everyone has to sort of take that charter up. So to be more sort of specific, because I feel like I, that's the way I think of it, it's kind of nebulously, but this idea that the work should have a political, or always has a very particular political um, position, as opposed to a, a multivalent political position, uh, a temporal political position, a complicated and sometimes um, not always affirming political position, it's something that oftentimes artists of color are not afforded in these arenas. And that's the everyday you see that, and you're like, huh, we didn't make it into the future. I want to be very clear, I'm not advocating. No, 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 I wasn't. I wasn't that this work has to be political by any means. I just want to be very clear. And what political looks like or, or is what I'm going to say. We want to give uh, Jay an opportunity to ask her question if you have a question for these people who are coming after you, working in, in art or in the kind of intersection also for people out there um, with fashion and, uh, and <coughs> But I would like to, to, to ask, um, what is it that, that you could do to reflect uh, the past, but in upraising to our spirits in order to make a voice for for today. Well, since you looked right at me. <laughs> Responsibility and charter. Um, it's you know, in whenever these conversations take place, the word political politics, is, the word political in politics is used over and over again. And what I feel is never defined is that what what are the politics you know um, that we're speaking to that we're moving towards. It, we can't assume as artists, as institutions, as curators, as historians, as scholars, etc., that we're up to good, that we're doing good because we make art, uh, because we go to museums, because we create collections. In many ways, those actions are actions to reaffirm power, um, to uh, reshape existing power structures, but they do not necessarily dismantle them. So, in a way, what I hear you saying is, what do we do with the material of the past to create a kind of future dynamic that actually um, um, allows us to imagine something that is productive and whole, something that creates a space where we can not be simply surviving, but where we can be, you know, to use a kind of um, generic phrase, where we can be thriving. Um, is that a part of, of what you're speaking towards? Yes. Um, 
I, I often hear reference to uh, the actual um, experiences that have occurred in, uh, in, in segregation and, and as though one doesn't get it if you propose as an artist, you know, you, artists are visionary. So um, to be able to go to the next level, to be able to um, express something that would be classic and lasting, but a, a good principle to, uh, to swallow and take with you to the future. And I have a real problem with um, articulating the actual instance. Um, the mission of, of our group, uh, AfroCobra, was to uplift, yeah. to restate, to direct as, as a visionary, like many artists have in the past for their people. It hasn't been the strife that they, they uh, may have illustrated, and they, they may have. But the point is that you recognize it, and you may that there may be a, a way to uplift to an extent where you know that this is change. This is not the usual. This is the future, mm -hmm. and future lives and and thrives and impresses and makes one you know those you know want to envelop it. And so that's what I'm wondering about your vision when. Your choice. In many ways, hopefully, if when you're a visionary, you don't know what you're looking at. You know, you're kind of looking at um, a kind of blank space, in, in my view, a kind of unmarked space. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why it's so important in my work that, you know, I am attempting to create a, a space where Formative gestures can play themselves out. Mm -hmm. can, you know where those actions can play. You know, be it a painting, what have you. Um, but I also do you know, very literal things where I sort of think of the work as some making work retroactively. Um, you know, you're sort of talking about the future, but in many ways, I'm sort of fascinated by influencing. Uh, the future by sort of thinking about making something now that I'm sort of inserting into a, a, a time or space that has already passed. So I make a work in 2007, but I think, oh, this should have been made in 1970. And so I think of it as a kind of historical insert. Mm -hmm. um, and that influence, hopefully influences my you know vision as an artist, but also sort of moves and sort of shifts how we look back at something that already has uh, occurred. Thank right. you. Just um, insert one question and then uh, we can go to questions after people answer because I know there are burning questions out there, I can tell. Um, the kind of basic question that I have is, um, do materials matter? We talked about materials on the last panel. Um, maybe Adam can start by telling us what we're looking at, but you all have worked, all of you have worked in a variety of different materials, and I think bringing different materials um, to different um, aspects of your practice or into different sites of activism or different places um, of display. So do materials matter? Is there something about the type of materials you would use in one space that you would not use in another, and so on. So what is the importance of materials, or do materials not matter at all um, in, in how you're making work? You're just going through one after another, and maybe, Adam, you can start with this, because I think everybody talked about what they were looking at, except for you. Um, of course, materials matter, um, but, <laughs> you know, they matter in just in a very practical sense. Um, what does it do? What can it do? You know, what what does a moving image do? Uh, what does a still image do? What does paint do? What can it do? 
Um, anyway, so what we're looking at is actually a, a still from um, a piece that I shot in 2011 in uh, Oakland, California. And it's a portrait of the former chief of staff of the Black Panther Party by the name of uh, uh, David Hillard. And uh, David, I believe, was it is in his 70s. I think he was in his maybe 76 now. Was 70, a little younger when the piece was actually shot. And I went to shoot this piece because I was asking my question. Um, a question that I continue to ask myself today, what is a relevant politics, you know? Um, and I wanted to do that by entering into a conversation with David. Um, and the conversation that I entered into with David was one that sort of looked at the borders of representation and abstraction in relationship to creating a portrait of an individual who has or has has and had a very uh, tangible and uh, specific political past as one who participated um, in the forming and conceiving the idea of what the Black Panthers are. So David gives uh, these tours, these Black Panther tours in Oakland where he takes you to different sites that are of important importance to the Panthers, like where the first breakfast program was, where they set up um, a, 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 a crossing zone for children to go to school, to get to school safely. Um, and so I'm basically riding around in the car uh, with David as he's giving this tour, and when he's not talking about the sites, I'm attempting to have a conversation with him which took about uh, 11 hours for him to finally sort of open up and to talk to me and not just simply um, reveal facts um, or things that I could you know, find in other, other places to, sh to show me some idea of who he might be in that immediate moment. So this still is actually an image of where we went to a house in Oakland where there were um, remnants from a shootout that took place two days after Martin Luther King was killed. And this is the uh, owner of the house showing us where um, a bullet struck the, um, gosh, I can't think of the word. Siding. The, not the siding, but when you go up the stairs, you have the thing on the side. Oh, railing. railing. Yeah, the, the, the railings to the stairs. So that's, that's what we're looking at. Uh, but this this piece in many it's a three channel video piece and in many ways it is uh, it's a it's a documentary but it plays with the idea of anything being a, a fact a historical fact an actual fact so what you're looking at and what you're hearing those two things don't often come together so David might be talking about the first Panther office but you're actually looking at the house of uh, of a of a Panther so. There's kind of, um, so it, it challenges the idea of how we sort of record things and how we create a kind of historical record. people want to answer without materials? I love, I, I love me some materials. I feel, like, <laughs> I feel like it's a great platform. I mean, you can, you know, what if the Eiffel Tower was made of ice cream? <laughs> That's just a, a, a new world, you know. So the material is a a, a, a point of con uh, of content, you know. You can make reference to historical materials as well as like what it does, like the physicality of, you know, um, time-based work versus um, you know bronze. Or, so I think materials is a great a great place, um, and I always get on myself and, and try and think about it, like, is this really the right material? Um, and it's a, a constant um, questioning. And you, you never, you know, you never know. They could have made it out of ice cream. I like texture. Mm -hmm. I think texture, three-dimensionality, you know, tends to, because I think of the human psyche, uh, you know, you want to touch it, you want to caress it, Experience it, so I love the texture. One of the things that uh, maybe next time we'll put a seminar together uh, 
the one of the pieces was called that I wanted to show today was called Reclamation Site Number Two, where I actually was able to go on the site of what is the current Harlem State Office Building uh, and pick up dirt and soil and wood chips and actually integrate them into, into a collage. So, but uh, the collar graphs, I love the, the, the medium of collar graphs. I don't know if you had any of that. So the experience is really, you know, from making the experience that's really full of just texture. Well, we're going to go to the Q&A now, so I know you've got all those questions stored up, people, so please come forward and, and get to the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hello. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first, I just want to say, this is a wonderful experience, and if we're talking about what was and what is, this is good that we have this chance to get together and have this conversation because we're hearing different opinions, different approach, and it's all part of what is, it's life. You're never gonna satisfy everybody, and everybody got their own mind, everybody creates in their own way. But I just want to say this, that if anybody create anything, piece of work, and you put it somewhere, it's up to me when I see it to get the energy from it, get the spiritual from it, get my, my own opinion about it. An essay don't follow work. So for me to hear an essay on, it sounds like you're questioning yourself and answering yourself. Because whenever you put a piece of work up, whoever sees it, if the energy's there, they get it. Okay, is there a question you have, sir? Yeah, there's no question. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure how well I can articulate this question, um, but do you find yourselves, I mean this goes out to all artists on stage, um, do you find yourselves um, wanting to call yourselves specifically black artists um, out of the whole industry of being an artist, or um, do you find yourself just wanting to be considered as an artist? If you're in a room um, with a whole bunch of artists, um, do you have to call yourself or be defined as a black artist? We went through a, a whole decade of, of questioning what is black art and are you black mm -hmm. artist. My simple answer is no, I do not want to be labeled as a black artist. I want to be, I want to be identified as an artist who happens to be black, but it has nothing mm -hmm. to do with who I am in the total sense of it. Art itself and the production art. That's my personal view. I, I'd like to say something to that effect, too, um, with regard, um, Addie Muller, um, to much of the work that you do is in, in reverence um, to sculpture um, and, and some of the artifacts of, of African cultures. Well, that's just it is. No, but I mean, I've seen something, you know, I own some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> <Back in the day. laughs> but I mean, the, the, the thing that is, is really um, fantastic is that uh, there are a, a number of um, cultures in Africa that do sculpture or three-dimensional pieces. And, and they are really, really classic and really are at the root of modern art, so to speak. So uh, they have, they're timeless and, um, and that's an interesting place to be. You know, it's not a labeling um, of, of the um, culture. It, it was simply the art and as we see it, we appreciate it and we see that it, it lasts forever. Yeah, um, thank you for answering that. Um, the reason why I ask is because um, I go to Bard High School Early College, and um, although the basis for the school was to incorporate um, a population more um, living in minority areas, my school is based in the Lower East Side, right across the street from the projects. It's very much um, a predominantly white school. And so oftentimes, like myself, there's a small black population and I see a correlation with 
people seeing me or my friends who happen to be of color as being black intellectuals, not so much like intellectuals. So I thought that um, I was wondering if the same thing applied in the art industry. Thank you. I think Stephanie had, you were gonna say something and then uh, we'll get to the next question. Thank you very much. to the structure of the, of the question um, and the idea, and I think that you recognize this, of course, the idea that black is a kind of as a kind of inflection of, of artist, um, and that and that and that other artists that, that it's possible to be, first of all, a racially uninflected or, or neutral artist or a politically uninflected or neutral artist, um, and that black artists alone bear the burden of negotiating um, that inflection. Of course, that of course that is a is a is, is false. Um, uh, I think it's really important for you um, and your your colleagues at um, Bard or the College. Um, where did you go? Oh, there you are. She's You're blocked by Leslie. <laughs> um, I think it's, I think it's really important for you and your colleagues to recognize um, um, and assert the. Um, uh, I guess the, the what what troubles me and it, what troubles me a little bit about your question is that it uh, seems to suggest that. It, 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 it creates this sort of impossible, it's impossible to uh, overcome this conflict between being a, like an artist and a black artist. You would never deny your blackness, right? right. Um, and at the same time, you wanna, you, you wanna um, be recognized as you know, equally, um, you know, neutrally, racially, as, as a meaningful artist uh, in a racially neutral context. And I think it's important to, um, to reject those terms, those distinctions, and even even if it's just for you and your friends, you know, personally, conceptually, that you understand um, that um, it's a kind of it's a kind of false uh, distinction or dichotomy. It's not, it, and it's um, as you grow as an intellectual. And I think Latoya um, spoke earlier really beautifully about the sort of opportunity for artists to navigate among discourses. Um, and serve as, as, as public intellectuals or um, as intellectuals who um, have the kind of flexibility to um, work across multiple domains. It's, as, as, you, as you continue to grow, it's important to take precisely that pressure um, and dismantle it. Um, and that, that is an important part of our project, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this question is for the contemporary or I guess newer generation of artists um, by way of the legacy of this older generation, if I can use that term, if that's okay. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here. Um, I think the Witness exhibition is just amazing and Dr. Jones, another wonderfully curated exhibition. Um, so my question is how these, these newer artists um, uh, I guess grapple with the legacy of groups such as Afrocobra, um, because the way I see it in amongst kind of many um, many effects of uh, groups such as Afrocobra during the 60s is that not only are black artists um, allowed into the institution, but they also forge their own spaces alternative to the institution as such. And I'm wondering um, how you guys find your own um, artistic uh, how your careers uh, benefit from this legacy, and do you see that you are um, as equally invested in institutional representation um, as you are in these kind of alternative spaces, or where do you see your artwork um, uh, working, really, in its essential sense? Are you directing that to me? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm... You mentioned that. She was, she was asking it to the contemporary generation, how, how basically do you see yourself invested in alternative histories and spaces as well as mainstream spaces? Yes. Um, and you can also answer it, but I think she was answering, asking it to uh, you guys. across institutional and alternative spaces um, and find that there are uh, one of you know because groups uh, because previous generations of artists have created created in, um, institutional spaces within which we can work uh, it's um, 
it's inevitable that we, you know, we, we benefit from those opportunities uh, that have been created. At the same time, I think, at the same time, I think many of us have also chosen to, um, to uh, there's, a, there's a kind of privilege associated with um, operating as, uh, as an artist, as Latoya described it, um, as an intellectual in our, um, in our cultural context. And one of those privileges is the ability to move among um, different kinds of spaces, from the spaces of our families, the spaces of our home communities, um, institutional uh, education spaces, as well as museums. And one of our opportunities and our responsibilities, I think, is to, uh, is to, is to bring our, um, is to speak um, in, in, across all of those domains. I don't know if that's a good answer to your question, but it's a little bit planned. <laughs> It's possible that the sort of expectations of what the institution, how the institution can serve, is is sort of the question to ask, um, or that I ask myself as a question. I feel like my um, colleagues do too, where the institutions afford an opportunity. That opportunity can exist physically here, or it can become a film, a, a publication that can extend out and also incorporating partnerships with other um, institutions within the community and alternate communities um, at a great distance, whether it's like um, partnerships with uh, institutions in Nairobi or just down the street. I feel like the, the, the way I come to understand institutions constantly grow from like visiting the museum as a kid, this museum as a kid regularly, to working in after school programs that teach. I was, the, the idea of the institution was like, it just showed art on a wall. But I've learned that these talks, the, these uh, programs that teach children things, is senior programs, the institution is as valuable as you force it to be and as it wants to, well, I, I like as you make it. <laughs> One. Oh, I, do. I just wanted to say something about fluidity. And I think that's something that's distinctly different in our time, especially with hindsight being 2020, seeing the way that certain institutions or people or individuals were traumatized, attacked, misunderstood. Um, you know, I think part of perhaps not wanting to answer, I don't know where you are now, um, that, or, yes. Yeah. That uh, part of, when you asked that question, there was part of me that didn't want to answer it because I felt that it would lock me into one strategy. And I think part of it, um, which I think was referred to by Stephanie and Kimberly, is that fluidity is actually a part of it, like moving through various spaces. I also work collaboratively where my name is completely dissolved. And I rarely talk about that work because I feel like the work needs to operate without the branding of my, my individuality, which is what happens often in our context. I'm also an educator. I also write, also write about other artists' works. So I think it was hard for me to just all of a sudden solidify that and think about that in rela relation to the historical strategy, because the historical strategy also um, was dismantled in various ways, um, which I think even Adam's uh, piece is speaking to. You know. Um, the, in tragic but also in beautiful and amazing ways. Um, so I think fluidity is something that I, I just wanted to point out as um, maybe a nuance that's added to the way in which artists strategize to address institutions. So we have our last question. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I wanted to, my question also is for the emerging next gen artists. It's a follow up question I felt that was, was asked but not completely answered about the um, post-civil rights issues in terms of race and, and, um, into, and access for the post. So there was a time when you were not allowed into the building at all, and now you are there as an individual, maybe, or as one. And I think what I heard in that question was that somehow the challenges today are less than the challenges that were there in the past. And I wonder, what are the challenges today? That's what I heard the question to be. What are your challenges today as individuals, as artists, as people? Um, I think there's a 
I was going to say, I think some of the challenges are in, um, uh, brought up by all of us in fluidity, like this notion of, um, so there was a, a moment uh, to sort of use the, the language where you weren't allowed into the building or you weren't seen on the walls so that there was a lack of representation within an institution or a series of institutions. But as there's been development in that way, what that expectation of that image is, what that, what, how you can operate within those institutions, um, where, where your historical position, like uh, often in relationship to trauma as opposed to a projection of future, like those are challenges today. Uh, a kind of, I think of it as a, 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 a myriad of, of present description and also the, allow, the allowance, I guess, for future projections. The idea that you can exist beyond history and that you can live in myth and sort of um, have this fluidity. I think that's a kind of challenge. That's at the, the core of most of the challenges that I yeah, I just, I just, and I mean all of this in an optimistic way, but you know, I, I feel as though we're we're all talking as though uh, we have arrived, and I'm not talking about African Americans or anybody, but but I'm simply, and I again, I mean this in an optimistic way. You know, things are really bad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, if, if the goal is or was to get, you know, into the, quote, institution, then that's really sad, you know. And there's so much more that we have to do. And instead of talking about, oh, we weren't allowed in the institution and now we're allowed in the institution, I mean, in my mind and in many ways, I really don't care. You know, I really just don't, you know, in the sense, oh, I'm here, I wasn't there, because the, the stakes are much broader than that. You know, they were and they are. I mean, what's interesting, you know, I think when we, let's say we look at the 60, the 60s is that, you know, these were questions that we weren't even supposed to ask ourselves. For example, am I an artist? Am I a conceptual artist? Am I this? Am I that? You know, we didn't, no one had the kind of, um, the, the privilege or the luxury to sit around and ask those questions. And I still don't think we should have the privilege or the luxury to sit around and ask ourselves those questions today. There are more urgent things. And I think that's sort of what I was speaking about, you know, when I said, you know, what is the difference between being an artist, an activist, and a, and a citizen? And I think we have to think about you know, sort of how those things can influence each other instead of, again, assuming that as artists we are doing good, that as institutions we're up to good, because the truth of the matter is we're probably not. We're probably not, you know, helping move things along. You know, we're probably just, you know, in other words, you know, you had a period, like when you talk to a person like uh, David Hillard, you, you, you know, you realize that these guys were under real duress. You know, you had the FBI trying to tear them down. Nobody cares if, you know, I hang, you know, a black dot of painting in MoMA. No one, you know, the FBI doesn't investigate me, you know. So in a, in a real way, I am perpetually as an artist saying I have failed. You know, and I became an artist because I thought it was, in fact, an activist position. But that was 12 years ago, and now the more I, you know, sort of become involved in the structures that the art world has established, I often feel as though my efforts are futile and I would be better served to doing something else. Um, but I mean that in an optimistic way. <laughs> Thank you all for a beautiful panel, all the artists, and uh, 